are today, and you need to know where you're going to be, what your goal is, and you have to have markers along the way to know that if you're on track. And songwriting is the same thing. That's why I love it. It's part science, it's part art. Uh, there's usually maybe only 40 lines in a song, at best, to say something, and you want to take people on some sort of a journey and give them an experience and maybe entertain them and enlighten them maybe. And it's a lot, a lot to ask for a song, and that's why I like it so much. And so uh, I started thinking about who's my ideal audience? I have to know who I'm writing for. And I started thinking who it could be. And I thought, well, for this first song, uh, I can only do one song at a time. The first one, I'm just going to tell that the lyrics speak for themselves. And so I gave a chronological play-by-play, -play, uh, accurate and truthful of what happened. And the video is wildly exaggerated. Uh, it shows images of, of a guitar being thrown, uh, you know, like the Olympic hammer toss or three spins and sent flying this way, and it was doing stuff like that. But the lyrics are actually quite accurate. And I sent the demo. <clears throat> when I was really happy with the song, it, I stopped uh, feeling like, a, like I was in a customer service phase, by the way. I felt like maybe I'd reclaimed some power. When you're in one of those things, you feel like you don't have any power. And uh, I sort of felt like things were sort of turning in my favor. And when I was happy with this, the demo, I sent it to my friends in the film, or the music business, and I said, guys, guys, United broke my guitar, can you help me make a good sounding uh, recording? They said, sure, we'll donate our time. So I had a good sounding record. And I took that demo and I sent it, uh, sent it to the friends in the film business, and I said, United broke my guitar, can you help me make a video? And they said, sure, what's your budget? And I said, zero dollars, is that a problem? And they said, oh, that's what we would expect. And so uh, they said, we, they, we'll help you though, we'll give you a one day video shoot. We'll, take, we'll show up, you have to do almost everything yourself though, because we're just going to show up with the camera, uh, a little bit of crew, maybe two people behind the camera. You have to find all the actors, you've got to do everything. So if you go and check out the video, you'll notice certain things like, maybe the guys aren't necessarily singing the right words at the right time, things like that, because we didn't have times for second takes or anything like that, and, and uh, I had to ask people to be in this video that would do it for free. So there were no professional actors of any kind, and it's this really campy, uh, kind of funny video. And we shot that video in June of 2009. We went to the Waverly Fire Hall, where I'm from, in Waverly, Nova Scotia. And uh, I'd been a volunteer firefighter there for five years. And I called my chief and I said, Chief, we're looking for something that looks like an airport tarmac. Can we use the parking lot of Station 41? And he said, uh, absolutely, you can. So we had our location. So all of the outdoor scenes, if you watch the video, you can see that they're all done uh, at Station 41. We shot the video in about eight hours, which is really fast. If you know anything about shooting a video, including lunch and everything, that's where my $150 went. To sombreros for three guys, mustaches for those guys. We had uh, lunch for everybody, and that blew pretty much my budget of $150. And I left that day thinking, we just did something really fun. Uh, it doesn't even really matter if anyone ever watches this video because I had just brought my friends together. I had empowered myself when I felt really frustrated all those months. I would actually done something that was, uh, it never felt like work for me. Writing songs and playing music is something I'm passionate about. It never feels like work, so that alone made it successful. And I thought, if no one watches it, it's okay. Uh, but that was in June, and I got the, the video finally on our version of the 4th of July. Canada Day is July 1st in Canada. And I got the video and I thought, this actually looks really good this could actually do something. So I thought I'd better develop a social media strategy to support this. And I, I thought, uh, I've got to do something macro and something micro. This has to be all in or nothing. And six days later, I hadn't done anything. I got busy. So I said, why don't I just post it to YouTube? And that's what I did. I posted United Breaks Guitars to YouTube on Monday, July 6th at 11.30 p.m. And that was my entire social media strategy for United Breaks Guitars. I posted it at 11.30. I went to bed 30 minutes later had six hits. And I was convinced that all six were my hits. Because I was prepared to watch this a million times, right? I had made this vow. And fortunately, I didn't have to. What I didn't know, though, was that if you, uh, and you may know this, but I didn't know at the time that if you watch a video uh, a thousand times from your host, it only ever counts as one hit. And so when I had six hits when I went to bed, social media had already started to work for me. I just didn't realize it. And so when I woke up the next morning and I had 300 hits, I was excited. I called uh, Steve Richard, the cameraman for United Brakes Guitars, and I discovered he's one of these guys that you don't ever, ever uh, want to bring a fresh idea to that you're just sort of sculpting, you're trying to uplift into something special, because he's a realist. We all have friends like that, right? You don't go to those people realists. Because I called Steve, I said, Steve, this is great, we got 300 hits, man. He's like, yeah, but don't get excited, this could be over my noon. Right? And 
by noon, though, there was uh, 5,000 hits. And by dinner time, 25,000 hits for this video. And I didn't have a, a smartphone at the time, I just had a regular cell phone. And normally, if you had something like this happening, you'd probably be watching the count very closely as it rolled, one at a time. Even. And I had to leave the phone alone, and I had a gig that night, about two hours from Halifax, playing to a bunch of uh, fire chiefs. And I got off stage, and there was a message from the LA Times. And they had heard about this thing from the Halifax Chronicle Herald newspaper. And so I ended up uh, doing a, an interview with the LA Times, and they said, it might be in the overnight edition. We don't know yet. And the next morning, on Wednesday of that week, less than two days later, it officially started a media frenzy. Because on Wednesday morning at 6 a.m., my wife Jill and I were woken up at 6 a.m. by a radio station in Halifax, and they wanted to do an interview based on this thing called United Breaks Guitars that was in the LA Times. So it went from the East Coast to Canada to LA and back to Halifax. And we got up and we couldn't believe it because we went to the kitchen to check out uh, the laptop and see what the camp was doing, and it started to go up exponentially. That's a true definition of a viral video when it goes up from 4 to 8 and 16 to 32. The words viral video get thrown around a lot, but it has to go up exponentially, and that was happening. And my email inbox was full, the phone was ringing. Uh, we were overwhelmed because our son Flynn was only three months old at the time. We were first time parents, and we were tired all the time and overwhelmed by that. And instantly, we were officially overwhelmed. I had a small home based business. I had to double the size of that business within two hours when I drove to Walmart and I bought a card table and a two line phone. <laughs> and went home and hungered down for a really intense couple of weeks. We, uh, fortunately, I had a, a great small team, a small but mighty team, I say. Uh, I remember looking across the kitchen in those early hours, and Jill, my wife's a great multitasker, and I was taking a phone call, doing an interview, and I looked across the kitchen, and she was taking a phone call, answering an email, and breastfeeding her son, Flynn, at the same time. And so I knew that, uh, as I say, we needed some help. And I called on a friend of mine named Julian Marinta. And Julian was working for the Canadian Cancer Society at the time, but he agreed to take a leave of absence until I didn't need him anymore. And so basically for about a month, he was my right-hand man. We were together all day, every day. And his job, we went to Staples and we bought a black book that was the source. If anyone wanted an interviewer to talk about this story anywhere in the world from any source, it had to go through Julian into the book. And he would just tell me where we were going and who I was going to talk to next. And I was doing these interviews from 7 in the morning till like 11 at night. And then I would go to bed for three or four hours and I would wake up and do the European morning circuit with the time zone differences and stuff really exhausting and really exciting all at the same time. And at one point we were doing these things called double ender interviews, which involve you going to a TV station and there's a, a back room that some station somewhere else has rented it essentially. They put a phony mural of the town you're in behind you and they give you an earpiece and there's a camera and a live feed to uh, some other source. But you never see the person. You, know, you never see the person you're talking to because of the, the visual delay maybe, it might throw things off. So they just have you hearing them. And I had no media training. I was just doing these interviews without any media training. And I learned very quickly how important it is to look at the camera the whole time while you're doing the interview because I was kind of treating it like a phone call. And I had my eyes be kind of wandering around as I'm talking and I discovered that you look really shifty and untrustworthy if you're not looking directly at the camera, right? And so uh, in those early days it was, it, was, it was crazy, it was exciting. Uh, we're driving, Julian and I are driving back and, and he's right beside me in my Honda Fit. He's talking on the phone to people and it's ringing all the time and I don't know who he's talking to but it was usually exciting. And I was doing an interview while I'm driving and I hear him take a phone call from Bob Taylor of Taylor Guitars. That was the guitar that got broken and, and I say that's like God calling you on the telephone if you like Taylor Guitars. And, uh, and But within about 10 seconds I hear him basically hang up on Bob Taylor. So I couldn't believe it. I said, Julian man, you just hung up on Bob Taylor. He's like, yeah, but we got David Letterman on the line. And we did. David Letterman's producer on the phone, and he knew all about the video, uh, and we were talking about maybe going to be on lately. And it looked like, better than that, as the day progressed, uh, we were going to be going to New York that Friday, and we were going to be on Regis and Kelly in the morning, David Letterman at night. Mike Huckabee, former presidential candidate, plays bass guitar, which I didn't know, but he wanted to play bass guitar to United Brakes Guitars on his Fox show on Saturday in New York. And on Monday, we were going to be on the CBS morning show, and that was was unbelievable. But almost on that same day, it all came crashing down where they all bailed on the interview because it became clear that they all felt that maybe they had been scooped. That this had seen its 15 minutes of fame and that uh, there was nothing else to really talk about on it. And we learned very quickly that the media are very uh, friendly and eager to talk to you until they don't feel that they need to talk to you anymore. 
And as dejecting as you can imagine that might be, it only lasted for a couple of seconds because right away, uh, instead of going to New York, we got a call from California and Taylor Guitars asked if we wanted to go to California and uh, do some interviews out there and get a tour of the plant. So we did. So Julie and I went up, Julian and I went up there and uh, got to do some really interesting interviews and have some fun. But the best part was uh, to get a tour of the Taylor plant and see how they make these beautiful guitars I like so much. And at the end of the tour, they had a room that had a wall about the size of this, the red drapes here. And they, it was covered in guitars, all the makes and models they've ever made. And they said, thanks for the publicity, Dave. Pick two when you're done. So Taylor Guitars gave me two new guitars, uh, which I really enjoy. And we have a great relationship to this day. But what I discovered, though, early on, in terms of the media, frenzy and, and all of that stuff, was that depending on who the media was that was covering the story, you might be more or less interested in hearing the story yourself. And so for my musician friends, when they found out that I was in Rolling Stone magazine, they, they finally took notice and said, dude, this is actually pretty big. And I thought, this is pretty cool. And for me, uh, in the early days, I was on the CNN situation room with Wolf Blitzer. And for me, that was kind of transformative because I knew how big, what the reach was on this show. And I watched uh, Wolf Blitzer a lot, and I thought it was really cool. And I came home, and it had, it had been recorded. And my house was electric. People were uh, acting like I just won an election. Everyone's hugging each other, and they were passing around finger sandwiches. And you know, if a finger sandwich comes your way in an event, it means somebody's died or there's a wedding or something. It's the food of, of weddings and funerals. And uh, I watched this interview, and there was Wolf and friends with their sombreros and their mustaches, rocking out like crazy. And Wolf Blitzer himself, he's rocking out. He's going like this. And. I just thought that was kind of neat. Uh, and I did a bunch of interviews like that for quite a while. Six months later, uh, my parents finally got interested. Uh, my parents lived very close by, and my mother, uh, uh, anytime something cool would happen, like Wolf Blitzer, she'd say, wow, that's great, I'm proud of you. And they meant it. They're, I've always been very proud of my brother and I and anything we've done. But six months into this, I finally got a, a call one day from ABC Television. And I said, mention that to Dad. And my dad, who doesn't like the phone, he calls back right away and he's like, Dave, Reader's Digest, that's huge. This is going to help your CD sales, you know. <laughs> so depending on the media source, it was a pretty uh, cool. Uh, and one other thing I guess I noticed is if you have uh, a music video, which is the number one music video in the world for an entire month, which happened to United Brakes Guitars, uh, some people, if they're interested in your music, they might want to buy some. So I called my mother because she'd been doing our, uh, our mail order for years. In fact, we've been around long enough that we were touring before the internet. And if we were traveling as an independent band, you couldn't always guarantee that your stuff would be in stores for a very long time. And so if somebody didn't uh, have an opportunity to get a CD, they would somehow uh, find my mother's address. It would take some investigating work because you couldn't just Google Sons of Maxwell and get an address. The people had to do some digging. So my mother would get these envelopes sometimes uh, from people with a nice handwritten letter saying, you know, we love your son's music, and here's $20 cash, can I buy a CD? And my mother was always so impressed that somebody just liked her sons alone, never mind uh, that they trusted her with $20, that she would knit them a dishcloth as packing for these CDs. And we were building a brand that way. Uh, we still have fans to this day, we still have those dishcloths, and uh, so it speaks to my mother's ability as a knitter, but we were also building a brand. And so when the video came out and we had an e-commerce e solution, uh, I went over and I said, how are the CD sales? And she says, look, you got to come in here and look at this, look at the sofa. So I go in and on the sofa there's yellow manila envelopes piled ten high, two rows on the whole length of the sofa. I said, this is incredible. And she was in the basement I said, this is incredible. And she yells back up, yeah, it's our third sofa full today. I said, get in the car, we're going to get you a sectional. This business is going crazy. So the CD sales were, were uh, pretty intense, but I also noticed uh, that I think it was starting to have effects outside of me. And uh, as a musician, I first noticed it in the music industry, because a light sort of went on and said, you know what, as an independent band, I've had a hard time trying to reach people with my music. Uh, all independent artists, everybody who plays music, all we want to do is play our music to people who want to hear it. And the challenge for musicians in the last hundred years has been trying to navigate this music industry that's developed that acts as an impediment.
that, had that for me to get to you, I might have to have the right manager, the right record company, the right distribution, publicist, all of these things, and everybody's taking a percentage of the gross along the way, so that really talented artists sometimes have major hits and they have no money at the end of their career because everyone has taken a percentage of the gross and left them with nothing at the end. And that's been a challenge, uh, especially for independent artists. And so now all of a sudden though, thanks to social media, what I discovered is artists have access to a mass audience directly. And while the regular music industry was trying to do business as usual, by accident, I sort of went all right over that completely. And I reached 150 million people, not just with a song, a country song in this case, it was my story. And if you take one thing away from this presentation, it's this. Your story is more important than anything that you can tell people about what you do in terms of your features and the things that you sell. Why you do things is more important than what you do. And there's a, a brilliant uh, speaker named Simon Sinek who talks about that, how important your why is. And I would convey that uh, more important than just your why is, is the power of story, because your why is best conveyed by how well you communicate your story. That's the way to cut through is through great storytelling. And that's what I managed to do. And I was reminded of this early on because I got an email one day from somebody who said, it started like this, he said, Mr. Carroll, I hate country music. And that's not a great way to, if you have a country song, and uh, to start an email. But what he said next was kind of cool. He said, I like the way, though, that you've handled this whole project. I like the integrity that you're uh, handling all this with. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to buy everything you've ever, uh, you have for sale in your store. All your music, uh, anything you've got. And at that point, we had about 10 CDs and some t-shirts and stuff, and he bought $300 worth of things, uh, sight unseen, and he didn't listen to any music, he just bought it. And that told me something very important. It says that if someone buys into your story, in this case for me, uh, if I had tried to sell one song, a country song, I would have lost 99 cents because he didn't like country music. But because he invested in my story, he bought 300 times what uh, I would have lost if I had to try to sell him what I do. So that was kind of one of the big epiphanies. Uh, social media is often what I would call one of the big pillars of this story. A lot of people are fearful of social media. They don't really understand what it is and because everybody's still so uh, busy, no one's ever gotten less busy as, as, uh, as time has gone, gone on. Uh, people are sometimes fearful of social media because it's like another thing I gotta do and how do you do it? They don't know what it means or they don't have the skills and they don't have the time. The truth is, is there are people that can help you with social media if you, don't, uh, if you don't have the time or the skills to do it. There are solutions out there, but it's so important more than ever now that you understand that your brand is nothing more than the sum of the conversations being had about it. Your brand is nothing more than the sum of the conversations being had about you and your product. And so you owe it to your investors, your employees, everybody else to make sure you know what your customers are saying about you in real time today and uh, deeply. And so if you aren't uh, involved in social media and you don't uh, believe that it's relevant, you should probably change uh, the perspective a little bit and look at it as an opportunity because I really think it is. Customer experience is another pillar of United Brakes Guitars. I found out very quickly that customer experience in North America is a $120 billion a year industry, which as a traveling singer-songwriter I never really paid much attention to. But what I discovered though is that after I spoke at a passenger's rights hearing in Washington DC in September of uh, 2009, I was there to uh, give some testimony and speak at a passenger's rights hearing that was gonna obligate airlines to take off within, leaving, uh, take off within uh, leaving the gate within three hours. If they didn't take off within leaving the gate within three hours, they would owe something like $25,000 a passenger. So it's really punitive. And that was because, you probably remember hearing about planes that were stuck on tarmacs for a really long time. And 15 hours or something like that. And finally the legisl legislators had said, we gave you enough time to fix this problem, you're not doing it, so we're going to legislate it. And while I was there, everyone speaking that day was supposed to be on the side of the bill. But one of the speakers, I had a hard time understanding whose side he was on, because he was a former CEO of a major American airline, and he was saying things like, it should be four hours, not three hours. Airlines have it really tough, and that basically airlines take off on time, almost every time, to the point that these rare instances, like JetBlue stuck on the tarmac for 15 hours, they happen so infrequently that they're statistically insignificant. And when I heard, heard him say those words, statistically insignificant, I thought, this is unbelievable. This is, this is a man who's been in business for decades. He's extremely well-spoken. He's very articulate but he doesn't understand customer service, especially in the age of social media. 
Because what he's saying with statistical and significant is that it's okay to marginalize a portion of your customers. All you have to do is try and get it mostly right most of the time, and the ones who don't fit into that, they're expendable. And that is totally not what's uh, an option for companies today. I think my video and my experience at least says that, that every customer today is important and every customer has the ability to change your brand positively or negatively, depending on how they're treated. And so you have to be the type of company that shoots for 100% every single time. You can't be the type of company that shoots for 98 or 97. And if you don't, your, your competitors probably will because there's a huge difference. When a customer walks through the doors of a business that's shooting for 100% and one through uh, the doors of a company shooting for 97, it's a palpable difference. You can feel that. And it's not fun, and it's not a nice place to be in that 3%. And so uh, the truth is, is that you're never gonna get it right 100% of the time, but if you do have a customer service failure and you're shooting for 100, your customers are much more likely to give you a break and a second chance because they know you're trying. And that is really important. Another area, and I, I kind of say it's the third and final pillar of United Brakes Guitars, is in the area of branding. With branding, uh, I think there's been a lot of academic study. I mentioned there's 400 books that have been written to talk about it one way or another, and Harvard does a case study. But I think I learned everything I need to know about branding as far as this is concerned through my family, and you probably do too. You probably have all sorts of stories that have taught you lessons about how to care about other people and how to protect your brand. And there are three videos. If you watch the first one, I encourage you to watch all three. They're called United Breaks Guitars, United Breaks Guitars Song 2, and United Breaks Guitars Song 3. And the second one is my favorite for a lot of reasons. We wanted it to be uh, more interactive and bigger. We wanted it to be kind of like the Ben-Hur of customer service videos. And so we had 150 people volunteer very quickly on Facebook. We told them, all you have to do is show up with a white shirt and a white hat, and we'll tell you where, when, and uh, how this is going to play out. And so on the day of the video shoot, we went back to the Waverly Fire Hall, where we had this big green space uh, in the back, and we wanted a high angle shot, because uh, we wanted to recreate what had happened in that first video, where there was a scene where I'm sitting on what's like the airport tarmac, and I'm sitting um, overcome with grief, like I'd been in a car accident, and what's, uh, an, uh, an ambulance type person comes and takes, the guitar away and leaves a chalk outline of a dead guitar. And we wanted to do that again with the second video using people with a high angle. We wanted people to stand in the shape of a perfectly intact guitar. And so we had everyone hold their positions. We had a scissor lift that went up 60 feet and a camera looking down and they had a megaphone, a white megaphone that you see like in the movies. And they were, uh, the director was yelling down at them, okay everybody, pay attention here. You gotta get this right. We have one shot to get this right. We're losing light. It's been a hot day. We're worried about people uh, getting dehydrated and that sort of thing. We're going to start the music, and when we say action, we want you to stand exactly where we told you to, in the shape of a perfectly intact guitar. And we want you to plant your feet, but move, dance, and have fun. So everyone start dancing like that, and then we're going to say action, and we want the last, say, 15 people to make up the headstock of the guitar, to sort of shuffle to a pre uh, predetermined place and break the neck of the guitar. And then we want everybody to get off the field and leave Dave alone in the center with the guitar in his hand, and he's going to put the guitar down, look up at the camera, and walk off. And then we had a white cargo van that had United written on the top to come in and, as a big finale, run over that guitar three times. <laughs> and that's how the video ended. So I said, that's what we got to do. Does everyone remember that? We got one shot. Here we go. And action. So everybody's got their feet planted and they're dancing. They're having fun. And they said, action again. And the last 15 people are shifting their way to where they need to be. And they break the net with the guitar. And it looks awesome. And then everyone gets off the field and leaves me alone. I got the guitar. I put it down. I look at the camera. And I go to walk off. And there's still two people there. And it was my 88-year-old grandmother and the woman holding her up. Because my grandmother didn't get the memo. She wasn't listening closely enough that she was supposed to get off the field. And so you see me walk up to my grandmother very quickly. And, and uh, we're walking off the field and I'm whisking her away as fast as possible. It looks, looks like we're having a conversation, but she's actually scolding me. Uh, being from England, they really... Never told me anything of the sort. And we got off the field. And, I really liked it, and so we kept that in the video. We didn't, we didn't have a chance for a second take anyway, so it had to stay in the video, and it's kind of a blooper that I really liked. A couple days uh, later, I finally got the, uh, the video to, to see, and I thought, this looks pretty good too. We posted it right away, and it wasn't as uh, in interesting to media as it was the first one, but there was a big spike in interest, and a phone started ringing again. I was driving one day in my Honda Fit by myself now, and I get a call 
from a casting director in Halifax. And she says, Dave, uh, Olympia Dukakis, Oscar-winning actress, is coming to Halifax and we're shooting a feature film. We're looking for actors. I couldn't believe it. I had to pull over the car to collect myself, waiting for the question. She says, we want to know if your grandmother's available. <laughs> so we'd like to work in video too. So I went home, I said, Grandma, Grandma, I said, you're going to be in an Olympia Dukakis movie. And she's like, the Olympics? What on earth do I need to be in the Olympics for? I said, no, not the Olympics, Grandma. I explained it to her and she relented. And so uh, a few weeks later, she was in an Olympia Dukakis movie in a hospital scene on the Halifax waterfront. And she made $160 and four hours to open and close her eyes on command. And uh, she went home and she donated the money to charity. And she declared, I'm retiring from acting, David. I like to keep a low profile. And uh, a few months, uh, not long after that, uh, she was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. And uh, I miss my grandmother a whole lot. She was a fantastic woman and I learned so many things from her. But uh, what I learned more than anything from my grandmother was how to die with dignity because she died with this tremendous dignity. She didn't uh, complain about her fate. She accepted what the doctor said. She didn't take any medication. And she never complained about anything. She did say, though, that she didn't want to die in a hospital. Unfortunately, she didn't have to because she died living at my parents' home in her bed one morning. And it wasn't just any old bed. It was her wrought iron bed that reminded her of being a little girl back in England. And the reason that, that I think that's important to talk about in these presentations is because you might think, being an independent singer-songwriter, having the number one music video in the world for an entire month would be the biggest takeaway for me, my biggest achievement, if you will. And it's not even close, not even remotely close. For me, uh, the takeaways that I hold most dear are the things like my grandmother getting in an Olympia Dukakis movie, or my friends with their sombreros and mustaches singing their guts out behind Wolf Blitzer in the Situation Room, or it's the <coughs> friends of mine that showed up and they gave me a wonderful, wonderful performance on the audio, and my friends who showed up with their camera crew to give me a great professional video and how we all got along together and laughed our heads off and maybe the people that took the time to watch the video and be in it and maybe some of the people in this room who took some time to watch the video as well. Because I get to do a bunch of things now. I got to write a book which I never would have done. I've traveled the world as a speaker. I get to do so many cool things that I never would have been able to do if I didn't have the support of other people. And that was my lesson in terms of branding, is that my brand rests upon the stories of other people. My entire brand rests upon the stories of other people. It's my grandmother, it's all those things. And so does your brand. No matter it's, whether it's a personal brand or your company brand, uh, the days where we try to hold on tightly to all the information within your silo and don't share anything and worry about who's gonna take from you, I think we're in a position now where we can actually share and let people contribute to us and lift our brand up to a place that would never have been otherwise. And that's not a bad thing, it's a very good thing. And so, uh, People have asked, why did this video succeed? Why is it so successful? And that's kind of the big question. And initially I said it's because it was funny and it did all these uh, cool things. It used music and the, the audio and video were really high quality in a time when people weren't doing that so much. But I think in the last couple of years I've learned more than anything else that the reason that the video is so successful is because you and I are connected. You and I, everyone in this room, everyone in North America and across the world are fundamentally connected, I believe. Social media doesn't connect us as the people are always saying. I believe social media only allows us to experience the connection that already exists. We don't have to do anything to do that. And uh, that was kind of a trans transformative notion for me because uh, unless you, you've got mental problems and you're suicidal, most people care about themselves a whole lot. And if you care about yourself and you believe you're connected to the person beside you or a person a country away, you're gonna naturally care about them and it's gonna be easy. You don't have to pretend to care about them. You know, it's not work. It never feels like work. And the beauty about caring is that it's free and it's contagious. When you care about something, it explodes in all directions and hits everybody. And so that, the lesson here is that it, you can inject caring into your organization if you're working the, the switchboard at the front door of a building or if you're at a CEO, it doesn't matter where it happens, but it's a good thing for your organization and it makes you feel better and it makes you enjoy your work and it makes everybody associated with you feel better. That's how important caring is. And if you don't understand how important caring is but you think it could be a good idea, where do you get started? It starts with just changing your perspective a little bit. You just have to change your perspective on how you see things just a little. And I'll finish, if I can, with a story. A true story 
about my own family that I was reminded about this thing, perspective. My wife Jill and I have now two sons. Uh, Flynn was three months when the video came out, but we now, uh, Flynn is now five and Fisher will be two in a, about a month. And uh, we took the two boys and uh, Jill and I went to Magic Kingdom a year ago, January, and we had a great uh, experience. We wanted everything uh, perfect. We had the fast pass bracelets for everything we wanted to do. We had a stroller that held both kids in case they passed out from exhaustion at Magic Kingdom. And we were coming home one night, it was dark out, and Flynn, our oldest, saw the Star Wars simulation ride. And he saw that ride, he said, Dad, we gotta go on that. Well, we walked up, and I didn't want to go on that ride, but I thought, he's not gonna make the height restriction, but sure enough, he made it by just a little. And so I was committed, we had to go on this ride. And, but the sign said on it, if you have a back problem, or you get motion sick, you probably shouldn't go on this. And, and I do get motion sick on rides that do anything like that. And I thought, this is Disney, though, how bad can it possibly be? Well, it, it was pretty bad. And we went on this ride, we walked on, because we had the fast pass bracelets, we zipped right to the front of the line, we went right inside, and if you've ever seen this ride, it's got uh, a pod that holds maybe 15 or 20 seats, maybe six rows, and we get in there, we're first in, and Flynn goes right to the front row, first thing I see, seat belts. Not a good sign for someone who doesn't like motion sick, motion sick type rides. But we get in, we buckle ourselves in, it's a 3D ride, so we gotta put on the glasses. The ride sort of begins almost right away, and we're doing battle with everybody in space. We're flying upside down, we're doing everything. I'm instantly getting sweaty in the neck. I'm pulling my neck like this, trying to get some air, wishing it'll go away. I'm closing my eyes, I'm turning my head this way, and looking at the 3D, because I heard that negates that. That doesn't happen, it didn't work at all. And I look over at uh, Flynn, Flynn's being thrown around like everybody else in his seat, and I'm thinking, this is every man for himself until this ride's done. Well, the ride ends about two minutes later, and I'm not feeling good, and I say that to him. I said, Flynn, I'm not feeling so good. How are you? With his 3D glasses, he looks up at me and he says, I pooped. <laughs> he says, but just a little. Right? And that taught me uh, right there that there's a, there's a serious difference between someone who's four and 44, and that the difference, I guess, is that uh, a four-year-old will always see a qualitative and quantitative difference between pooping in your pants just a little or a whole lot. About a minute later, the door opens, we get out of the ride, and my wife can't believe it, because we've been gone five minutes. And I look like I've been in the drunk tank all night, and my son's got the gait of someone who just pooped his pants, right? He's walking, talking like this. And my wife says, Flinny, what happened? Did you poop your pants? He says, yes, mommy, but we were in space. <laughs> so the lesson is, uh, you know, that we had the exact same ride, but wildly different experiences, because our perspectives were different. It made a world of difference, uh, the difference of perspective. And so the lesson for you, and, and in any business, any person, uh, personal life experience, shit's gonna happen, right? But you do have a choice on whether your pants are gonna be half full or half empty when they do. So I wanna thank you for your time. And